My name is Allison Weir. I'm uh, executive director of If Americans Knew, and I'm president of the Council for the National Interest, otherwise known as CNI. Thank you for being here tonight. Tonight I'll be talking about the media aspect of the lobby. U.S. media have long played an essential role in creating U.S. policies supporting Israel. What Americans think they know about Israel-Palestine comes from TV and radio reports, newspapers, magazines, and occasionally books. For decades, the media have been giving Americans a highly Israel-centric view of the issue. It is this very filtered reporting on the region that is central to the promulgation of U.S. policies that enable Israeli actions that create violence and tragedy in the region and deep damage to Americans, and that prevent justice and peace. Historian Richard Stevens writes that adherents of the political movement that created Israel, Zionists, understood from early on the basic nature of the American political system, that governmental policies can be made and unmade through force of public opinion and pressure. Stevens reports that procuring influence in the media has been a key component of Zionists' success. In our media, we consistently, when there have been suicide bombings, there are moving and thorough coverage of these everywhere, in every TV, radio, newspaper, etc. Uh, we hear a great deal about rockets from Gaza, although we are virtually never told that in the entire time they have been used, they began sort of in the late 2001, 2002, that that entire time they've killed a total of about 20 people. That is less than Israel killed in a few minutes in Gaza a few years back. So we hear about the rockets, but we don't get the statistic that goes with them. Um, today and around the country, I try to tell a little bit about what the media leave out, and then I'll go into the lobby's role in the distortion that you'll see. Our organization, If Americans Knew, decided to do statistical studies of media coverage on this issue. We decided to look at a category that would be universally acknowledged as significant and that was quantifiable, so we chose to look at their study, their coverage of deaths among both populations. We looked at the major media and some local media as well, and we especially focused on the first year of the current uprising, because first impressions are so powerful. They determine how people will see the context, the conflict from every af ever after. They set the context they decide for us who is the aggressor and who is defending their population. The first year is very important. Uh, the first thing we needed to do was to answer a very sad question to evaluate the news coverage. How many people were killed that first year by the other side? Using an Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, we discovered that 165 Israelis were killed by Palestinians and 549 Palestinians were killed by Israelis. How was that covered by our prime time network news shows, CBS, ABC, NBC? We found that they covered the Israeli deaths at rates three and four times greater than they reported on Palestinian deaths. Some of you may be wondering how they uh, reported the deaths over 1 it's over 100% of the time. Well, we had set up our study to count every time there was a report on a death for both populations. So if there was a follow-up report about families burying loved ones, for example, then we would count that as well. We knew, therefore, that the reporting could theoretically exceed 100%. We were astounded to see that it cons consistently uh, very consistently is 100% or often far greater for Israeli deaths and never comes close to that for Palestinian deaths. We then looked at a subcategory that's even more significant, the killing of children. We are all horrified, I believe, and deeply saddened when we hear of children being killed, no matter what their race, ethnicity, or nation, I believe. It is especially newsworthy because children are not supposed to be killed. So we decided to analyze that coverage. The number of children killed was 28 Israeli children killed by Palestinians and 131 Palestinian children at least killed by Israelis that very first year. How were these tragic deaths covered by our primetime network news shows? 
Well, they reported on Israeli children's deaths at rates up to 13 and 14 times greater than they reported on Palestinian deaths. Even though the Palestinian deaths occurred first and in far greater numbers, at least 90 Palestinian children were killed before a single Israeli child was killed, but we never heard about those. Another way of looking at our study these are, is this chart, where the dark blue in the Israeli column are the number of repeat reports on Israeli children who had died, making it appear to us that more Israeli children are being killed because we hear of them so often whereas that exceeds the number that were actually killed. Whereas in, the, whereas in the red column, the Palestinian column, there's a vast empty column where, uh, who's of children who were killed by Israelis whose parents are still grieving for them that we never even heard about. Another way of charting that is in this column. This is from the New York Times reporting, our you know, newspaper of record, probably perhaps the most significant news newspaper in the United States, perhaps, perhaps of the world. In this case, we decided to graph this chronologically during the first year, the first 12 months. This blue curve is the New York Times reporting on Israeli children killed, those 12 months. Next, we'll see the actual death curve for Israeli children, which is lower because the New York Times again had so many repeat reports on Israeli children, but it's following the same curve. Interestingly, it makes sense. Next, we'll see the New York Times reporting on Palestinian children killed that first year, which is this one, this red line. Uh, as you can see, it's lower, but it's following the same curve. It's very, a very similar curve. That's the New York Times reporting on Palestinian children killed by Israelis. Next, we'll see the actual death curve of Palestinian children, and here it is. This bizarre pattern is what we have found again and again, and the full studies are on our website. Uh, others have done similar studies. National Public Radio, NPR, many people will say, I assume this group knows better, but many people will say, oh, I know about this issue, I listen to NPR. In 2001, NPR was being attacked uh, strenuously by the Israel lobby claiming that it was pro-Palestinian in its coverage, a very serious accusation. So fairness and accuracy in reporting FAIR, a well-regarded media watchdog organization, decided to study NPR, NPR's reporting to see if that was correct. Their researcher, Seth Ackerman, did an excellent job, and he found that, yes, indeed, NPR's reporting was very distorted, but once again in a pro-Israel direction. Uh, Seth gave his study what I think is a brilliant title. He called it The Illusion of Balance because what he found NPR was doing was that they had carried almost the exact same number of news reports on Israeli children as on Palestinian children. That looked like balance if you didn't know what was going on. But that wasn't balance, that was distortion. That means that they were reporting on almost all the deaths among one population and a small percentage of the deaths among another population. We found that this becomes even worse when you look at regional media. Bad as this is, and this is off the charts of unacceptable journalism, we find that regional newspapers are, the, the, the percentages are, are even far worse. One of our first studies was of the San Jose Mercury News. This is just a random, typical American daily newspaper. It's in Silicon Valley near Stanford University. In this study, we looked at their front page headlines. Many people are so busy that we you know, might just skim the front page headlines for the day, but at least that way we're keeping up with the big news, the important news of the day, we believe. So we did a study of that. The first thing we needed to do was, in order to evaluate the, that situation, was to know how many people died during that period. Using an Israeli organization, B'Tselem, we found it was 121 Israelis killed by Palestinians, 384 Palestinians killed by Israelis. How were these deaths covered by this typical American newspaper, the San Jose Mercury News, in their front page headlines? They reversed it and increased the differential. So while that was going on, 
That's what it looked like to the typical hurried American. I was astounded. This was one of our first studies. I was astonished at such a distortion, a reversal. It struck me that what if the Mercury News had reported the Super Bowl backwards? What if they'd gotten the World Series wrong? And here they were committing a distortion, a reversal of that magnitude, having to do with lives and deaths, and no one noticed it. The LA Times, uh, many of you know, but we consistently hear about these periods of relative calm that are suddenly interrupted by Palestinian violence. The LA Times had an article in 2005 about the period of relative calm. I called them up that night. I saw the story on their website before it came out in the print publication. I hoped I could correct their inaccurate headline because here's what the rel relative calm had consisted of. 170, 170 Palestinians, men, women, and children, had been killed during that period of relative calm. 379 Palestinian men, women, and children had been injured, some permanently maimed, during that period of calm. And this is just a typical newspaper report. There are other omissions of significance, of course. A few of them are that there is dissent in Israel. There are Israeli soldiers who are refusing to take part in what their government is doing. There are uh, women that are opposing it. There are rabbis for human rights. There are Israelis against home demolitions. There are excellent Israeli journalists who are reporting on it. Most Americans have no idea this is going on because it is not being reported. We are not hearing about that either. Uh, another omission of a very different type happened on Capitol Hill in 2003 in the Rayburn House Office Building here in Washington, D.C. Uh, there was a report by the uh, Independent Commission on the Israeli Attack on the USS Liberty. The chairman that, that day on Capitol Hill was Admiral Thomas Moore. He was a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a four-star admiral, the highest military rank one can have. With him that day on Capitol Hill in 2003 was retired Rear Admiral Merlin Starring. He had been head of the whole legal department of the U.S. Navy. Part of that commission was General Ray Davis, a Marine general who at that time was the highest ranking Medal of Honor recipient in the United States. They announced their findings that Israel had attacked a U.S. Navy ship that had, had killed or injured 200 Americans, that rescue flights had been ordered recalled by the President of the United States, the only time in history that has happened, that this consisted an act of an act of war by Israel against the United States. And yet, none of those statements by this extremely high-ranking Blue Ribbon Commission on Capitol Hill, in Congress, None of these statements were reported by the Washington Post, the New York Times, Fox News, the supposedly patriotic network, had nothing to say about these statements. USA Today, a few years later, had an article that misrepresented it, and the uh, journalist who wrote the article was, by coincidence, an Israeli citizen, Oren Dorrell. During this time, the last 10 years and long before that, Palestinian children have been being killed in large numbers. Why don't we know this? Why aren't we seeing them on television? Many of us remember Vietnam when we saw those tragic and grotesque images of children being killed, of people being napalmed, of violence that made it very real. I believe that helped end that horrible war. We're not seeing those. Why not? Well, let me tell you why. Uh, they are getting them. Some people think, well, they're just not getting them, they're all living in Israel. No, they have stringers and reporters and photographers and videographers in Gaza, in the West Bank, risking their lives, sometimes being killed and injured, collecting footage for American TV. Journalists being killed and injured doing that. They're getting the footage, we're not seeing it. I'll tell you about one incident I, experienced, I know about firsthand, uh, this boy, uh, uh, tell about if there's time during the question and answer period. 
But another boy, and I won't leave these on the screen too long because they're so sad, but we should see them. I know you all do see them, most people don't. What had happened was uh, I was in the West Bank and I discovered that there was an AP bureau in Ram near Ramallah in the West Bank. I'd never known this. You call AP headquarters, they don't even seem to know it there in, in the US. They give you only the Jerusalem Bureau, which is in Israel. But I discovered, no, there's actually a well-equipped uh, bureau in the West Bank. I went there, I finally found my way there. I was interviewing the bureau chief about what went on. And uh, while I was sitting across the desk from him, he got a phone call about a little boy, and this is the little boy, who had been shot just within the last 15 minutes in the throat. He had been throwing stones at toward an Israeli armored patrol 300 meters away. And they had shot and killed this little boy. So he called it in, in my presence, to the control bureau for the region, which is in Israel. He called in all of the details, I heard it. When I got back to the US, I looked in LexisNexis to see all the AP reports for that day. I couldn't find a single report about that murder. By searching and searching and searching, I finally found it at, at some point in a news story about Israel, there was one sentence a boy, about a boy had been, been killed in a clash. Now, while I was still that night, I was at a hotel in the West Bank, better than I usually stay at, that had TV and CNN. And I was watching CNN, and this is CNN International, which is better than in the US. There was no mention of this at all. There was a lot of news about Israel, but no mention of this. So I finally figured out how to call their headquarters. And I said, I'm in the West Bank. I have a news tip for you. A little boy was killed earlier today. And the person at the other end of the phone said, I know, I've seen the footage. And I said, well, I'm watching CNN. I'm not seeing it. She said, I know, I agree with you. I'm the one who got them to show the, the footage of Mohammed al -Dura. I'm trying. We never saw it, so that's what I know. How long has this been going on? How long? A very long time. In fact, at least 100 years ago, this year is when it began. Before that, probably. In 1912, a Zionist official proudly proclaimed, quote, the zealous and incessant propaganda which is carried on by countless Zionist societies. In 1917, a study of four leading newspapers' coverage showed that editorial opinion almost universally favored the Zionist position. In the 1920s, other studies showed the same thing. Editorials and news stories alike applauded Jewish enterprise, heralding a Jewish return to Palestine as glorious news. In 1920, uh, the, the Yiddish press was almost entirely Zionist. Um, by 1923, only one New York Yiddish newspaper was not Zionist. These reached a million people by 1927. Uh, the State Department was, and, and the Defense Department, for decades were opposed to supporting Zionism because, for two reasons. One was, and they say this in memo after memo after memo, it's in my article, uh, that it would be very damaging to U.S. interests in the region extremely damaging to strategic and financial uh, U.S. interests. Also in their memos, they would frequently say, and it was also wrong, it would also be against what, what our nation stands for. So we consistently would, they were consistently writing those memos, but in fact in 1947 the CIA reported, however, that Zionist leadership was um, pursuing objectives that would endanger the strategic interests of the Western powers in the Near and Middle East. Lloyd Henderson, who was the high State Department official in charge of the Near East, as it was called then, said the support of Zionism would have a strongly adverse effect upon American interests throughout the Near and Middle East. Dean Acheson said it would imperil not only American, but all Western interests in the Near East. These policies of supporting Israel are not being driven by the State Department or the Pentagon. This, there is a, a documentary record of what they said, and they did not support it. Uh, one warned in, around partition that bloodshed and chaos would follow if 
the UN pushed for partition. And of course, we know there was a tra massive tragedy and bloodshed as the State Department and as the Pentagon were predicting, but Zionists push it, pushed it through with Harry Truman. The State Department tried to convince Israel to allow the refugees to return. In fact, General George Marshall, who was Secretary of State under Truman, was so outraged that they would not take back any, any refugees that he said, the leaders of Israel would make a grave miscalculation if they thought callous treatment of this tragic issue could pass unnoted by world opinion. But it did pass unnoted because as the State Department noted, the press didn't cover it. However, some journalists tried. For example, Dorothy Thompson was, according to the Britannica, one of the most important journalists of the 20th century. In fact, they call her the most important female journalist of the 20th century, Dorothy Thompson, whom I had never, ever heard of. Well, it turns out she was enormously famous. She had a newspaper column that was in hundreds, probably thousands of newspapers across the country, a radio program listened to millions of Americans. She was so famous that there was a Broadway play in which she was played by Lauren Bacall. There was a Hollywood movie based loosely on her in which she was played by Katherine Hepburn. Her husband was Sinclair Lewis, a very famous novelist at that time, major celebrity. She, in fact, was a wonderful journalist. She had been one of the first to warn people about the Nazis, about Hitler. She was the first foreign correspondent in Germany to be ejected by Hitler. Then, in about 1950, she discovered about Zionism. She, she supported Zionism. In about 1950, she went over to, the, to Palestine. She saw the Palestin Palestinian refugees. She made an excellent documentary that's on our website, Sands of Sorrow, in which she shows the refugees, she shows the tents, she tells about them. She began to write about them, she began to speak about them, and she, was, she lost her job. Uh, she lost her column, she lost her radio program, and she was virtually erased from history. Uh, I know I'm near the end of my time, so I have to skip ahead a little bit, but I'll try to just get to... <coughs> there's, there's so much, I'll no, just try to get to the last little bit, maybe. Um, the, the lobby has organized consumer boycotts against every major newspaper probably in the country, even though they're all very pro-Israel in their coverage, they still get boycotts to make sure that they toe the line and don't stray and don't start giving a little bit of information. This type of boycott cost an NPR affiliate in Boston a million dollars. Um, there are a lot of part, it's not just outside pressure. Within the media, you have people like Martin Peretz, longtime editor of the New Republic who says he's in love with Israel. You have the former Wall Street Journal editor who said, Shamir, Sharon, Bibi, whatever those guys want is pretty much fine by me. You have the former New York Times editor, Max Frankel, who admitted in his memoirs, I was much more deeply devoted to Israel than I dared to assert. I wrote most of our Middle East commentaries. I wrote them from a pro-Israel perspective. You have Ethan Bronner, who has, is just going out, but he's been the bureau chief in the region for the New York Times, whose son has been in the Israeli military. It turns out that's typical. I'll go for one minute if I can. Um, Michael, it turns out all sorts of people have had their sons in the military, or they themselves have served in the military. Uh, Michael Lerner makes a good point. He says that having a son in the Israeli army was a manifestation of my love for Israel, and I assume that having a son in the Israeli army is a manifestation of Bronner's love of Israel. He was the New York Times bureau chief. Um, we had another man who had been the, the senior foreign correspondent for US, US News and World Report who said, that's no problem. I was, I've been covering it for 40 years. And I had a son in the military. You have a previous Times bureau chief, Joel Greenberg, who was serving in the military even during the time he was filing bylines. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg was the, um, you know, as a pundit that shows up on TV all the time, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, now he's at the Atlantic. And uh, he is an American citizen who went to Israel, became an Israeli citizen, joined the Israeli military, served as a prison guard at one of Israel's most brutal camps, and now he is a commentator on our, in our news media. So basically, 
Um, Wolf Blitzer, we just have to mention him. <laughs> he, served, he, he worked for the, for the lobby for many years. Then he was Israel's voice of, uh, let me see if I, he was Israel, the voice of Israel as he would go around on talk shows. This is the anchor man, of course, for CNN. He wrote a book that basically covered for Israeli spying. Again, we should all know this. this is the, the, I've just written an article about the latest bureau chief at the New York Times. You can read it. We have it on our desk upstairs. Uh, other people have tried to oppose that. There are journalists that have tried to tell us the, the truth. Grace Halsell and Helen Thomas. Let's all work to get this information out everywhere and every way you can. Thank you.